Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they'd been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity of return. But now they desire a better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying to do, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? But the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, 
lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Look in diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the words should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heaven of Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who've spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried away with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience, in all things, willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that it may be restored to you the sooner. Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in 
you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints, they of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Lord, make my life today a life of prayer that I may intercede for souls everywhere. Lord, give me a burden today for the lost on life's perilous sea. Help me guide them safely to Thee. Lord, help me, I pray. One sat alone beside the highway begging his eyes were blind, the light he could not see. He clutched his old rags and shivered in the shadows. Then Jesus came and bade his darkness flee. It's time to open the word once again with evangelist Lester Roloff on the Family Altar Program. For all is changed when Jesus comes to stay. This has to do with marriage in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. He speaks to us from his permanent word, which will never fall or never fade. He said, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Now he's talking to Christians. And let me say this, I have no hope to offer the man that won't let Jesus in his home. I mean, I don't have any uh, hocus pocus, prestos chocus. I don't have any magic wand. I can wave over you straight in your problem. I mean, you're just sunk, my bud. I mean, it, you're, 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 you, don't have, you don't have anything to go on. I mean, you don't even have any foundation, see, to put your home on. And so without Christ, I mean, I don't see how anybody, because the Bible said in him all things hold together, are consist, are congealed. And brother, if you're not in him, I mean, if you're not, the Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Well, the parents that are not in the Lord, they don't have sense enough to tell the children what to do anyhow. Where'd you get your wisdom? You don't have any. The Bible said any man lack wisdom, let him ask you God. Now, you'd say, well, what is wisdom? Why, wisdom is Jesus Christ. Read your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The Bible said he is our wisdom. Now, if a man doesn't have Jesus Christ, you don't have any wisdom. If you have no wisdom, how can you build a great home? How can you have a great empire, a great nation, a great system of society? We can't apart from Christ. Where is the contractor that's not more concerned about his foundation than any other part of the building? Greatly concerned. Hardest thing to build. More sweat. More labor. Digging that foundation. Pouring that concrete. Than is anything else. But oh, how vital it is. How vital it is. So he said, let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now, while I, I won't get back to it, I'm sure, but let me say, every home ought to be a hospitable home. If you want to build a happy home, then you ought to share your happiness with others by being hospital and having them in your home. God's people, if I could say it and be understood, have always been great to entertain strangers and others and thereby witness to them and help them to come to Christ. I care nothing about entertainment for myself. I mean, I, I'm the least entertained preacher I'm sure you've ever had here. I mean, I never 
I want people to spend in time fooling with me, but I think it's a good thing to entertain people that you can witness to and give them a real taste of a lovely Christian home. God's people ought to be great entertainers. They really ought. You ought to take them into your home, witness to them. And uh, I care nothing about whining and dining and running out to eat. Fact is, I don't go out to eat once a year. And it's always a burden for me to have to do it. I'd rather fix a meal right there in the room, have the people over to eat with me, and uh, get uh, things done right there and have a witness to the But uh, I, you'd say, well, you hurt the cafe business. No, there'll be enough of the rest of y'all to go out and keep them in business. But anyhow, uh, what I'm saying is this. We need to be hospitable, and we need to entertain people, and we need to show them what Christ can do for them. For instance, Jesus said, when you get ready to have a big feast, he said, don't call your rich neighbor or uncle or... He said, call the blind and the halt and the maimed and the lame, the crippled, the poor. Go get them. Now, isn't that, now, I mean, isn't that reasonable? After all, don't you think they'd appreciate it? You go get an old blind fellow that's been sitting there all day long, maybe a week or two, nobody. Get over there and beat him by the hand and say, come on here. You're going over to my house and eat with me. He said, you don't mean it? Oh, yeah, come on. Well, he said, man, this is a real joy. I'm telling you, I didn't, I just been sitting here in the dark so long. Well, he said, you're not going to sit in the dark today. I'm taking you home with me. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Go over and get an old crippled fella in the wheelchair. He's, he said, man, you're going, I got a big meal fixed for you, fish dinner. Or, you know, I got uh, nice things fixed. And he, he said, why, I can't go, I guess. He always said, sure, you can. Oh, he said, I'm going, no, I will. Oh, you over that wheelchair? No, man. If I have to put a motor on it, I'll get you over there. I mean, you're going home. Wouldn't that be something? Now, see what I'm talking about? Listen to me. Why don't God's people quit entertaining each other? The average church, big old fat, greasy church, the only thing to do is feed each other. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah, get together. They have to have Wednesday night supper and, and uh, have to have sandwich night and potato chip night and Coca-Cola night and ice cream night. Everything you can think about entertaining one another. God didn't tell you to do that. He told you to go get the poor and the needy, the halt and the lame and the maimed and the blind. He said, you go get them. Bring them in there and do something. Amen. Two things will happen when you do it. Number one, you'll get a blessing that'll amaze you. Second, they'll get a blessing that'll make them think somebody loves Jesus. Why don't you try it sometime? That's the way to win people to Christ. All right? Then he said, remember them that are in bonds. It's bound with them. It's a great verse. Just like you're bound with them. And them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage, here's your text. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now turn with me to the book of Ephesians, please. The book of Ephesians chapter 5. This is just about solve all the problems real quick. Verse 23, first of all, verse 23, 5, 23. The husband is the head. He's the head of the wife. That's what the Bible says. Husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Straight line drawn there, isn't it? In everything. But husbands, he got a little word for us too. Husbands, and this will, this will suit the wife all right. This will get her in a good humor in a, in a hurry right here. Husbands, love your wives. Well, how much? Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I'll fix him up. Wife won't mind obeying a husband to love her like Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. I'll fix a home up right there. And children, I've already quoted your verse, found over in the sixth chapter. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, boys and girls, do you want it to be well with you? Would you like for everything to go well? You say, I sure would, all right. You better obey your parents. You better obey your mother and daddy. Because disobedience, will see, God will see to it that it will not be well with you. Now then, I want to share with you a challenge 
concerning the home, the home that will not bust or break. Dr. Truett, many years ago I used to hear him preach. He'd say the home is the citadel of the nation, the first unit of society. Now, I'm not interested in catering to your whims and fancies tonight. But I am interested in putting before you the kind of home that will stand the test. I'm interested in your home being happy, but I know it won't be happy unless, first of all, it's holy. Happiness is a product of holiness. Now, I have one other requirement. Well, maybe I should say I have one other uh, qualification that would entitle me to preach on this subject. First of all, I said I've observed my mother and daddy who set an example as an honest couple in the community and uh, taking care of their three boys. And then for 35 years, I've gone in and out among the homes. I've dealt with more broken homes probably than most preachers my age because of the work that I've been in. All of my delinquent boys practically come from broken homes. Most of the alcoholics and narcotic addicts are victims of broken homes and have already lost their home. Most of the convicts had lost their home before they were sentenced to the penitentiary or the wife got divorced while they were in the penitentiary. But there's one other qualification, and that is I have lived with one wife 31 years. And uh, we, though we have been absent one from the other, three-fourths of the time during our marriage because of the ministry of the Word and traveling, yet I can say that our adjustments are better now than they were the first year that we were married. Which means to me that uh, every day and every year ought to bring a better understanding. And as we grow older, we need one another more. So far as comfort and love and uh, understanding. Oh, if, if I could just get the mothers and daddies, and especially the boys and girls and young people out in Radio Land, to realize if you marry wrong, if you get tailed up, and then uh, you want to run the divorce court, uh, you face some real difficulties. You really do. That, uh, I believe the Bible would certainly warn us about. Now, let's look at the importance of the home for a moment. And it's so sacred. It, to me, the home absolutely ought to be something that anybody would be glad to get into. I mean, it just ought to be a real joy uh, for people just to get to go home. And so God, in the first place, built the first home. Now, whatever his standards were then, I believe they ought to be now. Since God doesn't change, sin doesn't change, human nature doesn't change, and the Word of God doesn't change, then I'd like to go back and visit the first home. And so one day God got together, and he took a little piece of dirt, and when he got to working on it, a man was standing there. And he called him Adam. And the Bible said he breathed into Adam the breath of life, and he became a living mew, no, a living man. See, he was a man. Now, I think that animals can be conscious, but we're self-conscious. I mean, we're conscious that we're somebody. And uh, we had the image of God. Of course, not much of the image left. I mean, you just look out. I mean, you know, I got thinking today down on the beach, uh, one of the finest things I've seen in Florida is, uh, is the dogs because they take the people walking every day, which will help some. <laughs> but, strange as it may seem, I haven't seen a Pekingese, a poodle, uh, a hound, or none of the dogs. I haven't seen one of them smoking. It's always a man that's trying to keep up with them and smoking. Isn't that strange? I, I haven't seen one of them uh, drinking out of a beer bottle. Haven't seen one of them licking a beer can down on the beach. It's, it's the other people that sit out there in the car and they're tanking up, see? But the dog's got better sense. 
Now, he may not be self-conscious, but he's conscious enough to know that that slop wouldn't go well with him. Now, God breathed in the man, and he became a living soul. And then Adam, being a sociable creature, God said, Adam, I don't believe it's well for you to be alone. And so the Lord is going to fix his first home now. So he comes, and uh, he gives Adam a good, deep anesthetic. First anesthetic ever given. Now, you know, when you read the history of, of, of doctors and medicines and operations, they used to put a big helmet on the head, you know, and bust them with a stick of cordwood. Or, you know, or a baseball bat or something, because that, and that'd knock them out. And while they knocked out, they'd cut them open and sew them up. Now, I'd say that's pretty rough anesthetic. Of course, they've developed now uh, various things that they can put people to sleep with. But listen, they thought they'd really gotten somewhere. When they, when they developed an anesthetic, they'd put somebody to sleep, and they'd just rip them open, cut them all to pieces, sew them up. They'd come to a little bit later on and wonder what happened. But remember this, God is always first in everything. Everything. Just name it. I don't care what you want to name. Space, he was in space first. Central heating unit, he was first with the children of Israel. Pillar of fire by night. And uh, all I could just, I don't have time to go into it, but I could just pick out everything man thinks he's ever done and said, boy, just look what I've done. God looks at, on the rim of the universe and laughs at him and said, well, you little silly outfit. I did that eons ago. I did that a long time ago. Ah, uh, listen to me. And so he made a woman. He put Adam to sleep. Have you ever figured out why he did put him to sleep? I don't know for sure that I know, but knowing myself and man like I do, I imagine he might have tried to interfere. And, and God wanted a lesson, a permanent lesson, didn't he? He wanted, now you listen to this, and brother, this must be the heart of it. He wanted man to know that who he got married to was none of his business. That was God's business. Amen? Now, you listen to what I'm talking about. I'm coming up on the lesson tonight that will solve our problems. I, he said, Adam, I'm fixing to put you to sleep. I'm going to take a rib out. I'm going to make you a wife. But you'll be so deep and sound asleep until you have nothing to do with it. And he said, this business of building a home is my business and not your business. Boys and girls, if you mothers and daddies and all the rest of us, if we realize that the will of God would settle everything, I mean, it'll settle it. It'll settle your race problems. It'll solve your home problems. It'll settle every problem you've ever faced, the will of God. What does God want me to do? Lord, if you want me to be married, then you send me a wife or send me a husband. And God is the one that makes the choices when they're made right. And so... He made him a wife, and he introduced him and said, Now, Adam, this is Eve. And evidently, evidently, God performed the first wedding ceremony. I mean, that's sacred, isn't it? Now, he said, Adam, do you take Eve to, you, to be your lawfully wedded wife? You're going to love her, be true to her, take care of her? Sickness and in hell? And uh, what if Adam said, well, Lord, I got any more to pick from? <laughs> I mean, Lord, is this it? I mean, you wouldn't give me a multiple choice, would you? No, sir, just take her or leave her. <laughs> If you want to be married, this is she. That's right. But now then, haven't people been stupid and silly and sinful? I mean, why don't we let God make our choices for us now? And they were married. And I imagine he said, Eve, do you promise to love, honor, and obey? A lot of preachers, they're scared to use that word obey against sissies. Casper milk toast. <laughs> I don't know why you'd be afraid to go with the Bible. That's right. I don't. I tell them, of course, I don't. I don't get to marry as many couples as I used to. 
<laughs> There's just a heap of people not prepared and qualified to be married anymore. Right. So I don't fool with them. Right. And a lot of them never have been married that I don't marry. I mean, if they think, they say, Brother Olaf, will you tie the knot? <laughs> will you put your blessing on our home? I said, well, that depends. You bring your boyfriend to the study or the office and we'll talk it over. You mean you want? I said, yes, ma'am, bring him by. I'd like to look at him. Smell him. <laughs> talk to him. That's right. I tell you little girls, you sure need to get things worked out before you ever get him. Yeah. Don't take anything for granted, see? He comes in the office and I ask him some questions. I said, you have a fine girl here, Bill. Yeah, he said that. She, she's all right. She's wonderful. Fine. I said, she's been a fine Christian. I said, Bill, I judge you're a Christian. No, sir. I said, you're not a Christian? No, sir. I said, you'd be willing to talk and pray with me about it and give your heart to Christ, wouldn't you, before you get married? You plan to build a Christian? No, sir. He said, I, not now. Uh, I'm just not ready now. Maybe after we're married. Well, I said, son... You're going to get somebody else to marry you because I'm not going to marry you. Oh, you'd say, Brother Olaf, Brother Olaf, nothing. You mean you want me to put midnight with daylight? If God can't do it, don't think Lester Olaf can. Amen. And I say that reverently toward God, too. I tell you, if our preachers would draw the line and they'd start letting these old unsaved boys that marry these little sweet girls that are Christians and have been brought up in the nurture and admiration of the Lord in the first place, no girl that's a Christian ought to ever want to marry an unsaved boy. Right. Now, if some of you wives are here tonight and you've already married one, stay with him, but win him to Christ just as quick as you can. Right. Amen. I'm talking about the home that won't bust tonight. God was interested, powerfully interested in home because he started it. Yeah. And then I'd say this, God has visited the home He's been in the home. Jesus, his first miracle that he ever performed was at a wedding. Eh, he went over there and gave him some refreshments, and he was there. I don't think Jesus was particularly interested, I mean, himself in a home, but he wanted to see other people's homes. I think Jesus uh, could. Have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't get married? But he never got married. Lonely, had no place to lay his head. Oh, I loved the home, and yet he never had one. Night after night, when he'd climb the mountainside, hear the laughter of little children down the street or down the road, and see some wife as she said, Yonder comes my husband, and run to the gate and embrace him. And Jesus climb in the hill to spend the night with his father. Nobody ever loved the home. More than Jesus loved the home, but he never had one. Never had one. But I want to say something else. And this gives a lie to a bunch of this filth that's being trotted out today. Psychiatrist, and we had a rather noted homosexual here last night. And uh, a fine boy, but been tangled up for years. He said to me, after we talked and prayed and and went into these matters and offered him help and hope. And, and uh, he said, well, Brother Olaf, did you know that most, and this is terrible, he's well-grown, out of the teens, handsome boy. This is what he said. He said that after all of these years in this practice, I'll have to say, that many of the doctors and lawyers and professional men of Tampa, Florida are practicing this awful habit that shakes a man's mind, tears him apart, makes him want to commit suicide. You think about that. Folks, as sure as I'm standing here with my right hand raised to heaven, this is one of the last plagues of sin just before Jesus is going to come. One of the sure signs that we're living in Sodom's day is the awful sin that goes like wildfire. And he really, fellas like that, they know. They said, Brother Olaf, you could never imagine how many 
And then something else that he said last night, and I told him, I said, well, are you interested in young ladies? He said, well, I could be probably, but now let him know that just getting married will not solve his homosexual problem. Why? Because a woman can't forgive a man of his sin and wash his sin away. And she can be no acceptable substitute for his sin. But the psychiatrist told him, I mean, just right flat out, and he's been to them and spent, I guess, hundreds of dollars during these many years. The psychiatrist said the only thing he could say, just have to learn to live with it. Just live with it. <laughs> Another psychiatrist said to the dad that's greatly disturbed, said, well, you don't have anything to worry about. I mean, there's nothing to worry about. It's just one of those things. Ah, uh, listen, dear friends, it's one of those sinful things. But I want to give you something tonight that I've never given in, in this message or along this line, just like I'm fixing to give it. The psychiatrist and the psychologist and this new philosophy, which is a new sin philosophy, they say, no restraints, please. No restraints. Off with the restraints. Let the boys dormitory just be welcome for the girls and the girls dormitory with the boys and no restraints. It's normal. It's natural. Let old Mother Nature have her way. You've got to give expression to the desires of the flesh. Let me tell you something. Jesus gave the light of that dirty plot. That's right. Jesus lived 33 years and he never knew any sort of physical satisfaction like that. Now, I want you to know one thing. If people will get Jesus in their heart, there's nothing absolutely essential about getting married so far as just taking care of the flesh is concerned. Why don't we have sense enough to see it? Whereabouts is our old-fashioned Bible discipline anyhow? I think there's a lot of people that's married, if I could just say it and get away from it, that you're bordering on impure living the way a lot of people live together these days. And I know too many things, and many I can't say from the pulpit, but I'll tell you, you talk about abnormality, and you talk about gluttons for the, for the flesh, and you talk about misery and unhappiness in the home, brought about by trying to build a home on a sand pile. I'm talking about the flesh. We'll never have happy homes until we build our home on Jesus Christ, Amen. where we have our fellowship with him and sing Ah, uh, listen, the mighty Xerxes spoke a mighty truth after he had walked down and had every soldier and every horse and every carriage in uh, a beautiful array for his inspection. And he paraded down and the salutes were coming from all over. And he looked and my, he smiled his approval at this one and that one and went back to his tent. And in a little while, one of his commanding officers came and found the mighty Xerxes with tears rolling down his face. And the officer was so disturbed, he said, Sir, did we not please our great leader today? I mean, were our soldiers not in true form today? He said, have we disappointed the mighty Xerxes? And Xerxes brushed away his tears and said, no, that's not it. He said, uh, the greatest army in the world today. But oh, when I came back and I viewed that last beautiful horse and that last faithful soldier, I just got to thinking, in just 50 years from right now, every horse will be dead. Every carriage will be rusted out. Every soldier will be through fighting. I'll be off the stage of action. And then he said, grandeur is so fleeting and glory of so short a time. We'll find that out if we hang around a little bit longer. Your slip, your step will, will slow up and your eye will dim. And the things that used to entertain won't entertain anymore. <laughs> But I'll tell you one thing. Though heaven and earth shall pass away, this old book will stand forever. Amen.
I've got these spiritual feet of mine firmly planted on the rock of ages. And I'm hiding in him that we sang about a while ago. Hiding, oh, thou blessed rock of ages. I'm hiding in thee. Let the devil look for me. He can't find me. Never shall forget that night when pastoring. And I was always asking, still do, Lord, give me something fresh for supper tonight for the people that will be coming. Let the table be spread. And let it be so fresh for me, it had to be fresh for them. And uh, the thought came to me. The thought came to me. And the Lord surely gave it. And I'd been thinking about the amount of eternal security and safety under the blood. And I said, well, and the Lord had convinced me that the only way the devil could ever get me is just to slip up under the blood. Just slip up under the blood. When he comes up under the blood and he reaches and gets me and runs off to hell with me. And I said, Lord, just suppose now, it's hard for me to suppose, but suppose the devil, just old Satan, old smutty face, he comes sneaking up under the blood, and Jesus stopped me dead in my tracks, said, I'd save him. Yeah, <laughs> amen. <laughs> I save everything that comes under the blood. <laughs> the blood's more powerful than the devil. Yeah. I said, thank God, I'll tell them about it tonight. Amen? <laughs> oh, I wish this whole world knew what I was talking about. If they knew there's only security in Christ and none other. Now then, the home builder. You know who the home builder is? Except the Lord build a house. Now then, if the Lord builds a house, it ought to be a good one. Of course, he's building mansions, you know. Of course, that's always fascinated me since I've been a preacher, a Christian especially, is that he's been, he, he got out on the ledge of nowhere one morning and said, I believe I'll make a bunch of worlds. And I'm telling you, he just, uh, as a colored man said, he picked up mud balls and started throwing them. And they just started being planets and everything in the world and the moon and the stars and everything got together. And why well, he just had, and in six days, he said, well, that's done. I'm not tired, but I'll rest anyhow. <laughs> right. And so he had it all done in six days. And yet, Jesus has been working on them mansions for nearly 2,000 years. What in the world is he building? <laughs> Man, I'd like to take a peep, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'm going to take more than a peep on these days. I'm going in. Yeah. Going in. <laughs> Glory to God. Oh, listen. A lot of people say, well, I don't know why he didn't tell us more, explain more about him, why we'd never be, we'd commit suicide and go on. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> How in the world could a man be happy living down here if he knew any more about him than you already know? <laughs> Man, I'm just putting up with this down here. <laughs> oh, listen, I'm talking about something real tonight. Jesus will soon be coming, all right? I except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wakes up in vain. Now, the Bible order is God is to be the head of the man. The man is to be the head of the woman, therefore the head of the home. The man is to make the living, provide for the home. The wife is to take care of the inside of the home and the children and to bear children and to be a godly mother, a prayer closet mother. You know, it's always interesting when I read, and I read it again, I think it was yesterday, where the angels came down, you remember, and they visited Abraham. Of course, they were going to go down to Sodom a little later. They didn't want to go. And, but they had that message of death. They had the message of doom for Sodom and for Lot and that bunch down there. But they came up and visited Abraham. They had a great time of fellowship. And the angels were there talking under the big old tree. And uh, they raised a question. It's always been an interesting question to me. Said, uh, Abraham, yes, where's Sarah? That's a good text, you know. Where's Sarah? I think Abraham just about got disgusted. He said, where's Sarah? Well, he said, she's there in the tent. Where do you think she is? The bowling alley? <laughs> you think she's down the bridge truck? You want my wife, you'll find her in the tent. She's in that journey. Ah, oh, listen, my mind sweeps back to my boyhood days when I came home from school. And if I didn't see my mother immediately, my first question, if I saw one of my brothers, Where's Mama? Oh, she's out there at the barn, or she's up to garden, or she's gathering eggs, or she's out there 
taking the clothes off the fence. She was always there, always in reach. And uh, before I got home, I knew my mama was there because I could smell tea cakes cooking. <laughs> oh, listen, I wish I could preach another hour. Women, you need to go back and dignify your home. I'm not talking about beautify. I'm talking about dignify spiritually your home and let your home be your main occupation. I mean, you ought to have surprises for your husband and your children. I mean, you ought to have delectable, delightful, delicious, and nutritious meals prepared for them. I mean, there ought not to be a restaurant or a Luby's cafeteria, Marson's, or nothing else that can compare with your cooking and your preparation. Why, listen, your husband ought to jump four fences in order to get home to eat with you. <laughs> I'm talking about something that's real tonight. Let the women go back like Sarah did and make it worthwhile for the husband to come straight home. Ah, uh, listen, he won't waste any time stopping at beer joints. He got a lot more home than he'd ever have in the beer joint. He got a good wife and some lovely children and the right kind of a home. Oh, listen, I know what I'm talking about. Yes, where's Sarah? Well, she's right here. Bible order, Bible order. Now then, let me give you how God wants to get your wife. I wish I, you turned to the book of uh, Genesis chapter 24. Seemed like I've taken more time uh, getting to this, and now then, uh, look like time's going to run out on us, unless you want to stay another spell. It's the 24th chapter. Now, I want to show you, it's in keeping with what I've said. There's a man by the name of Abraham. He's got a son named Isaac, and uh, Abraham's about ready to die and going to be with the Lord. And so he said, now, I want my son properly married uh, before I leave here, and the best way to do it is for me to get him a wife. Now, to me, that's sensible for a husband and a mother, a father and a mother, to help get their children properly married. And when you ignore the desires and the prayers and the wisdom of a Christian mother and daddy, you're being very stupid, young people. That's right. Why? Well, they've just got a lot more sense. I mean, they've got a, the wisdom of accumulate, uh, accumulated over a period of years, and you ought to help your boy and your girl get married properly. And so Abraham said to his eldest servant, get it, the eldest servant is a type of the Holy Spirit. And he put 10 camels in his care and uh, some servants and said, I want you to go to my people in a distant land, and I want you to pick out my son Isaac, a wife. And so he said, all right. But he said, uh, suppose I, I can't find one. Well, he said, you, your responsibility will be over. You do what I tell you to do. When you do what I tell you to do, then you come on back. So he went off, and he said, now, I want to get a wonderful wife for Isaac. So he got up there, and uh, all the goods of his master were in his hand, and uh, he took his camels, ten of them, up to the well, and uh, he uh, made them kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day. Show kindness to my master Abraham. And he said, Behold, I stand here by the well. Now, folks, it don't stretch my imagination a great deal for me to recommend to a young man, if you really want to get a nice wife, you go to the well to get her here. You say, what? I mean, you go where the water is. To me, that's a type of the Word of God. You go get a Bible girl. Don't get one of these little painted up uh, clowns and one of these little mini skirted outfits. I mean, go get somebody sort of like Rebecca if you want to. Go to the well. He said, I stand right here by the well and I want to get a wife right here at the well. And here comes Rebecca. Here she comes. And you know what kind of girl she was? She was a working girl. Man, I'm telling you, she knew how to draw water. She sure did. Now then, the average little girl couldn't even turn on the faucet. <laughs> oh, you're not going to make me ruin my hands in dishwater. Oh, listen, it won't ruin them. It'll just wash them off. Yeah. God pity the little old boy has to get married to a little butterfly like that. <laughs> And so here she comes, say what you will. She comes, she draws, and he said, Now, Lord, I want it though, when I ask for some water myself, 
I want her just to volunteer and say, listen, not only am I glad to share water with you, I'll draw water for all your camels. Now, you talk about they had tremendous radiators on them, too. <laughs> Every one of them. I mean, when you filled up a camel with water, I mean, they went for days on that water. And, and the camels uh, were sort of like Cadillacs or Lincoln Continentals today. I mean, if a fellow had a bunch, of, a bunch of camels, I mean, he was considered a well. He had 10 camels. Yeah, and so she said, listen, I'll draw water for all those camels, and she just drawed, and you know, of course, he's just like we are. He said, can you beat that? He said, do you suppose that she's the suppose nothing? Man, how could it be any plainer? Woman just drawing away, sweat running down her face, <laughs> watering all your ten camels? You ought to know. And so sure enough, he went on up to the house. Oh, this is sweet and precious. And uh, he got up there, and, of course, the father and the mother met him, and he greeted them, and then he told them what his business was and what his errand was. And he said, I'm here now uh, to uh, find a wife for Isaac. And they said, all right. But they said finally to Rebecca, said, Rebecca, uh, wouldn't you like to stay here for some real going-away parties? Oh, we just have such a great time. And uh, we'll have all your friends in, and, but we'll let you make the choice. And Rebecca said, Oh, dad and mother, I'm sure she said, y'all have been so wonderful. My, this is a wonderful time in my life. And uh, the Lord has answered prayer. And I love y'all so good. But I'd kind of like to get on down to Isaac. Amen. Oh, hear me. The church ought to be wanting to get on to Isaac. Did you know that? Yeah. Jesus is our Isaac. And we ought to be the Rebecca, clean. What kind of wife was? Bible said she was a virgin. She was pure. Boy, that's something. You know, used to, every girl, in order to have a white wedding, was supposed to be pure and clean and virtuous. One, if we really drew the line and said, listen, young lady, if you've ever been impure or immoral in your living, you can't wear a white dress, and we won't give you a church wedding. Rebecca, oh, I know, I know what the filthy boys and what a lot of these silly leaders of ours say, but dear friends, sin, still sin. Yes. And just like you reap just the way you're going to sow. Right. I mean, when you sow, you'll reap, and you're going to reap more than you sow. It works both ways, dear friends. You're not going to get by with sin without paying for it. Thank you for joining us today on the Family Altar Program with Lester Roloff. And they were blessed. He gave the weary rest. He made the blinded eyes to see. He fed the hungry soul, and he made the wounded whole by the waters of Blue Galilee. They sat at his feet, and they looked in his face, content in his presence to be, for no one before had cared for their souls like the stranger who sat by the sea.